Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. I hope your day is going great so far. I am doing very well. Thank you very much. It's a little bit cold here in Melbourne, but I am very excited because it's our 50th full length episode. Now, we do have a short introduction episode that I recorded a long time ago. I might redo that one, but I don't think that really counts. Now, we have a very special guest for our 50th episode, and that guest is Jivana Heyman. Jivana is a yoga teacher, a yoga therapist, the creator of the accessible yoga conferences that run all over the world, and author of the forthcoming book, Accessible Yoga, Poses and Practices for Every Body. Now, this is a topic that is very important to Joe and myself, and we thought that Jivana would be a great guest to have for this very special episode. If you're new to our podcast, you might not know that around four years ago, I was diagnosed with stomach cancer, and my stomach was removed later on that year. Yoga and meditation played an important part of my recovery, and though I'd done a lot of yoga previously, a lot of poses and movements were not available to me during that period of time. And Joe, who is an amazing yoga and Pilates teacher, was able to provide modifications that were much more accessible to me with the limitations that I had at the time. And gradually, I was able to build my strength back up. Way to make it all about me, huh? But seriously, Joe and I both strongly believe that individuals in all types of bodies should be able to benefit from the gifts that yoga can provide. People in larger bodies, people suffering from chronic illness, or the elderly, just to name a few examples. Now, part of the challenge of accessible yoga, I believe, is that it can challenge our assumptions of what an individual may or may not be capable of. Movements or postures that one person might take for granted might be nearly impossible for someone else. So how do we bridge that gap? Well, I think it's through empathy and presence. Only through fully acknowledging someone's capabilities and limitations can we really provide them with the help that they may require. Anyhow, I might be stating the obvious here, but that's my little soapbox moment. Before we get on to the interview, I'd like to ask you a question. What do you think are common assumptions or things we might take for granted in the practice of yoga or movement in general? And how do we address them? I'd love to hear your answers. You can join our Facebook group, the Flow Artist Podcast Community, or comment on our website at podcast.flowartist.com. Get at me. All right, that is more than enough from me. Let's get on to this recorded conversation between myself, co-host Joe Stewart, and our guest, Jivana Heyman. Perhaps you could just start by telling us a little bit about your background and where you grew up. I grew up actually in New York and Connecticut, kind of the East Coast, and then I moved to California right after university, and I've been living here in California really ever since. And how did you discover yoga? Oh yeah, that's a longer story, but uh, my my grandmother actually taught me yoga when I was a kid. She... Ah. She was, yeah, a really early adopter, and I think she probably started in the 1950s, because she's actually from L.A., so she was here in L.A. and doing that back then. And um, so then when I was little, she would she had a daily practice, and I was just always mesmerized by it. I would just sit and watch her, you know, when because she, she would live with us a lot of the time. And then eventually she taught me a little bit. And then I stopped, you know, I didn't really practice regularly until I, after university, I I was really struggling with stress and, and I just stumbled into a yoga class and actually what was really interesting. It was the same, it was the same kind of yoga that she was doing, which was integral yoga, Swami Satchidananda, which isn't really that shocking because he was kind of big in California in the sixties or big in the U S really, but she had studied with him. And then I ended up studying with a teacher that student of his as well. So that was kind of interesting. And it's also like, that's a set sequence of postures every class, right? Yeah, definitely. It's a very like organized, structured hatha, kind of classical hatha yoga school. But I think what's amazing about integral yoga is that, well, a lot of things. I mean, one is that, you know, he really tried to bring in all eight limbs and he would, and he would teach about them all the time. And also that he was really interested in, well, what we now call yoga therapy, but he was really interested in yoga for healing in general. 
And so that was, that was definitely interesting for me because I already had that kind of background going when I started doing my work with accessible yoga. I was actually wondering that. So were you always drawn to accessible yoga as a focus or is that something that evolved over time? Well, so I'm, I'm a gay man and I, I came out in, I don't know, 1984 or something, or 1985, came out of the closet and that was right in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. And so many people that I met and eventual friends and boyfriends and my best friend then got AIDS and died of AIDS. He died in 1995. And so I was, at that time, I really became an AIDS activist. And so I, I spent those years just like kind of a crazy alternative lifestyle. I mean, we were marching on the streets and planning demonstrations and getting arrested and doing a lot of crazy stuff. Like I was really out there. and. Um, I'm work, I worked in an AIDS hospice. I worked for an AIDS, an AIDS newsletter. I mean, I was just totally absorbed in that. And then I was kind of just going to yoga for myself. I kind of re- rediscovered yoga at that time, really just for, for me, because I could deal with that, what was happening to me. And then when I decided to become a teacher, it was like obvious that I would just bring it to that community, to my to my community, and that's what I did. So really, accessible yoga started with trying to bring yoga to people with HIV and AIDS. Yeah, um, just to respond. Started in San Francisco. Yeah, yoga would have been a really powerful force then as well, because I know that medical treatments have evolved a lot mm-hmm. now. But in the early years, there either wasn't that much available, or it just took a really intense toll on people's bodies. So having a practice that you could turn to that would just give you a bit of calm and space and clarity, seeing all of that around you and affecting people that you love would just be so powerful. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly right. It was, it was really a horrible time. I mean, you know, looking back now, it's, I forget that like even for younger people, they don't even really know (laughs) what would happen, you know, and this whole community was being decimated and, there, was, there were hardly any treatments. So in the early days, there were really none. And, and I was actually involved in studying some alternative treatments or well, writing about them. So I would write about alternative treatments for this newsletter. And yeah, I really felt that yoga was a great tool. I still do, you know, for in so many ways. And that was part of my inspiration. I was just wanting to share. And it was helping me. You know, I just felt like yoga really was keeping me sane and well, or so, something close to that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just wanted to share it with my friends and people who were really having a hard time and yeah it was quite something we had i had one class that went on for about 12 years in san francisco um at a hospital there for people with hiv and aids and i mean it was it was pretty painful at times you know that it was like almost one group but so many people in that group died you know and then you'd have new people come and eventually i opened the class to people with other disabilities too so we had more of a mixed group but i know that for many of them they felt that yoga was really life-saving you know, it really gave them some just grounding. I, I remember one student told me that, in fact, it was this is pretty early on, and the medications weren't working for him, and he was really almost near death. He was like skeleton thin and could barely come to class, and he was depressed. And he told me, actually, what happened was, so then I noticed he didn't come for a while, and then he came back, and he started to look better. And he told me that yoga really gave him kind of a second chance because he said it because of yoga, he didn't just kind of go fall into a deep depression, that yoga kind of helped him to be more peaceful and that he stayed alive long enough to get a new medication that actually then really helped. And, and he's still actually alive now. He, now he's a yoga oh, Wow. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Could you tell us about AccessibleYoga.org's mission today? Well, I could connect it to that story a little, which is that from those early classes, I and, and that was early. That was We're talking about the 90s that I was doing that work. And then when I eventually became basically a full-time yoga teacher, and I would I was leading 200-hour trainings as my, really my main job. And I started getting frustrated, though, because I noticed people coming to the 200-hour trainings usually were pretty new, you know, at yoga, a lot of them. And, and then I had long-time students who had disabilities who were really dedicated to yoga. And I felt that they would be great yoga teachers, but they didn't. many of them didn't want to take the teacher training. And I kept encouraging them but they wouldn't do it because I felt that it wasn't accessible to them for many reasons. So the, the name Accessible Yoga actually started where I, I started a 200-hour training for people with disabilities to become yoga teachers. That was around, I don't know, 2005, 2006. And so it was kind of, I had this kind of shift in my thinking about making yoga accessible. And what I was really focused on was making the kind of the deeper teachings of yoga accessible rather than because I knew there was a shift towards yoga therapy happening at that time and everything, but that's not really what I was interested in as much. Uh, even though I, 
I am a yoga therapist, but I, I'm more interested in just empowering people with tools. And I find that teacher training is a, just a great way to do that. You know, I love teacher training. It's like you get immersed in yoga. And so if you don't think of yourself as a potential teacher, you kind of miss out on that opportunity, which really makes me sad, you know, that we kind of save the good stuff for people who think they can be yoga teachers. And then most yoga classes don't go into, like I said, the eight limbs or really yoga philosophy or anything like that. So anyway, that's a long story. <laughs> no, that's great. The name Accessible Yoga and how it started. And actually many of the people in those trainings that I did back then are still on our board. So they kind of helped me create the organization. Fantastic. I find yeah. as well with um, teacher training, as well as being this chance to immerse yourself in learning about yoga, it's this chance to begin this real community of other people that love yoga and you're all learning and evolving together. Is that yeah. also part of the accessible yoga mission to really help people yeah. connect with community? Yeah, exactly. That's right. So I, I completely agree with that. I think to me, I would almost say community might be the most important part of yoga that without community, I'd say it's almost impossible to have a strong practice or a spiritual practice really without support of other people. And it just makes such a difference to me and in my life. Yeah. I guess the next part of the story actually is about that, which is that was all happening in San Francisco. And then I moved away for family reasons. We moved down to Southern California, which is quite far actually. And I had to basically leave my yoga community. And that was just about six years ago. And that's when I realized I was here um, feeling sorry for myself and kind of <laughs> lonely, you know, without my yoga family that I'd had for so long. And this was like so important to me. I was a little bit confused. And I remember <laughs> I was feeling jealous. This is what the main a story I tell a lot. I, I was jealous of the one friend I had here in town, who's Sherry Clampett, who's a great yoga teacher. She does therapeutic yoga. But I was jealous of her, and I thought, wow, that's not very yogic of me, you know, to be jealous because she's she was doing such beautiful work. She was teaching yoga at the cancer center here. She still does. I thought, wow, that's really not... I'm not practicing yoga, you know, if I'm jealous of her. That's just... I don't know what. So then I thought, well, I should use yoga to deal with this. And I thought of Pradipaksha Bhavana. Do you know that teaching from the Yoga Sutras? Oh, maybe say it out loud for people who don't know. Uh, <laughs> so Pradipaksha Bhavana is like basically replacing negative thinking with positive or opposite thoughts or just reflecting on your negative thinking. So I was thinking about it, about how I was feeling jealous. And, and part of it, too, is that I, I was kind of having to restart my whole like yoga career down here in the Southern California. And I just was feeling just so overwhelmed by the idea of all like the marketing and the kind of self-promotion that's necessary in the yoga world. Yeah. And just really resisting that. I think that's something that you are fantastic at. Not so much <laughs> self-promotion, but just promotion of accessible yoga and celebrating mm -hmm. other amazing teachers and practitioners and just like sharing this really great diversity of here are all of the different bodies with all of these different needs and they're all practicing yoga and you might be the one person in your town that's doing it but you are connecting people with this global community yeah that was exactly my my idea so when i really reflected on my kind of selfish worry and feeling of isolation and loneliness i realized that to turn it around to me, the opposite of that is to support others. And so I literally like, I had like this realization at that moment that it was honestly like a vision that came to me of my friend Sherry Clampett on a stage. And I, I realized that I needed to create a platform for yoga teachers who do the work that I admire. And that would also serve me. But my, you know, my, my focus was rather than on myself, it's actually supporting anyone who's doing that work, anyone who's trying to make yoga accessible. And that's why I created the conference. So we started the conference and that was my vision of Sherry being on a stage. And I thought, oh, we could have a conference and she could be a speaker, which she was at the first conference. So I was very, Fantastic. <laughs> it was very exciting. Yeah, it was great. And I'm glad you, I appreciate you noticing that because that is actually what I do. I actually, I don't share my own teaching very much. It's a practice of mine now. I mean, since then to just focus on others and to try to lift other people up who do the work I admire. Oh yeah. Well, you're definitely reaching a global audience because we've seen you all the way from Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, right. Here we are. <laughs> but isn't that quite amazing though? I just have to, I'm kind of amazed by it myself that it's actually because I was doing something that was not about me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I think definitely. That's what yeah. Yeah. I almost don't believe it myself, but it's true. <laughs> 
<laughs> my my ego still thinks I have to worry about myself all the time, but really, when you take care <laughs> of other people, <laughs> it kind of all happens. Mm. And my life just totally changed after that. It was just like amazing. It's been like an explosion, you know, of accessible yoga. Yeah, I hadn't couldn't imagine it. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about the conferences? Yeah. So, I mean, that that's the underlying theme for me. Still, I try to come back to that idea of mutual support and community and education and and that's what the conferences are about and you know these days so much happens online but i i really enjoy being in, in community in person with people so that's why we do them it takes a lot of like a lot a ridiculous amount of work to actually organize an event you know it, these days it's like when i look at what i can do online versus what i have to do to create a conference it's kind of silly but it's worth it because it's like a it's like a feeling of a family reunion honestly uh, at this point we've had about six already and i think i think and there's a lot of the same people and even though a lot of new people too but it just has this very sweet feeling there of community and they're not huge usually you're just under 200 people at each one and actually quite a bit a lot of presenters i usually have around 20 or 25 presenters because i want to give everyone that platform you know yeah yeah but, um, it's nice it's really just like a networking get to know each other learn a little bit so there's lots of short presentations people can learn about many different things happening in, in yoga and my idea is like you could come to a conference and maybe meet 10 or 20 different teachers and then decide oh yeah i'd like to study with that person it's just like a little taste yeah and uh, and I always give a, a, a homework assignment, which I actually posted today on our Facebook group, the same one, which is that I tell everyone who comes there, I try to get them to do the kind of same thing that I'm doing, which is I say, find somebody here who you can support. So that's your homework assignment while you're here. It's like, nice. meet someone. Yeah. And like, see if you're excited about their work and find a way to help them, you know, and then oh, you'll benefit great. too. Obviously, yeah. someone has to do that for you, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so nice. And actually, I've seen a lot of amazing things come out of that, really. Yeah, that sounds lovely. I could be a little negative about it too and just say I think that yoga, you know, we're facing kind of a, a large commercial interest in yoga <laughs> and I feel like this is the only way I can think of right now to counteract that, you know, definitely kind of commercialization, yeah. And it's counteracting it in a really positive, powerful way. Like you're not just being all, like, oh, this isn't what yoga is about. Like it's not just, you know, skinny bodies in leggings, but you're actually yeah. showing an alternative and showing an alternative in a way that could really, you know, if someone's perception of yoga is just what they see on Instagram, it could just be a complete turn off. Yeah. Like, this is not for me. This is not who I am. This is not, you know, what I'm all about. But because you just show so many different perspectives, you really give this full breadth of all that yoga has to offer. But also you kind of give voice to other people who might be a little bit hesitant about putting their own point of view out there. So I think it works in a lot of levels and I think it's really powerful. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting to me that the commercial, the commercialization of yoga kind of has this very dangerous effect in ways we don't even see it. And one of them is that many people don't think they can practice mm. or they could teach or they could teach. So even people who are practicing, who love yoga, they, many people who, you know, they, they might be passionate about yoga, but think, oh, I couldn't be a yoga teacher because I don't look like that. Mm. I don't look like that image I see. So I think that's, that's essential to me. I think we need to have more diversity in our teachers. And that, that's the only way to do it. Like, I, like you're saying, I like to put people out there, kind of lift them up and say, look, you could be a teacher too. Anyone can. Anyone who's passionate about yoga can be a yoga teacher. Uh, you don't have to be able to do anything extreme. I've, I've, I've trained people who are very limited mobility, people in, who use wheelchairs or whatever. I mean, Matthew Sanford is an example, if you know him. He's like one yeah. of the most powerful yoga teachers I know. He's paralyzed from the waist down. He's incredible. But I mean, anyone, you know, anyone who's passionate about yoga can share it. And I think that that's what needs to change is the misconception of what yoga is and who can do it. And I, I just want to just go back again to my early days as an AIDS activist because I actually would say so much of that is still in my head and I think the community organizing I'm doing comes directly out of activism and really trying to find ways to give voice to people outside of mainstream channels which is what we're doing marching on the streets back then now now there's other ways you know yeah, social media a line. Is yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I guess there are some visible factors that might block people's access to yoga or some perceptions that you know media contributes to that might be 
feeling like they're blocking people's access to yoga. What are some of the other factors that maybe people listening might not already be aware of? Well, I I think the biggest one is our own ideas about what yoga is or Mm -hmm. misunderstanding that people think of it as this advanced gymnastic practice. And it does seem like we've gone that direction. So I would say, yeah, for some people, their practice is extremely physical, but I don't think that's necessarily what yoga is per se. I mean, yoga is really such a broad thing and you could just sit and meditate and say you're practicing yoga. You know, in fact, meditation might be the ultimate practice. Yeah. So I think this misunderstanding maybe of yoga is the biggest obstacle. <clears throat> Don't you think? Yeah. I think another like another challenge I've thought of, we have a small studio and yeah. financial factors are a big right. issue. And this is something I've thought about for myself, like to make a sustainable living as a teacher, we're generally encouraged to specialise and to charge more for our time and more for our classes. However, like yeah. finances are a major barrier for a lot of people to attend yoga classes and especially people who might be dealing with financial stresses in their lives who could really benefit from yoga emotionally. And so I've just been trying to think about like, what are some ways that we can make yoga sustainable for teachers, but also how to make classes accessible for everyone financially? I'm, I also am very interested in that question. I would yeah. like to know how can we make, how can we make it uh, financially sustainable for teachers who, especially teachers who are dedicated to, to accessibility and equity and who might not want to necessarily work in a more gymnastic style of yoga because i feel like it, se- it seems to me i could be wrong but it seems like there's money in those large classes when you have a lot of people mm. when you offer a more accessible practice even though you reach a broader audience you might end up with smaller class per se like i don't think accessible yoga is a real money maker and that's concern to me you know i would like it to be yeah, because often it like it requires some more specialized training, which is also expensive. Yeah. And just to give everyone in that class a good experience and the attention that they might need, because there's often different options needed. You just can't do that yeah. for 50 people at yeah. once. <laughs> it's such a good point. I, I, I think that's where I differentiate accessible yoga from yoga therapy, because I actually think that accessible yoga, you don't need a lot of training to make your classes accessible. I mean, one of the things I do is lead trainings, you know, in accessible yoga. And I, there, it's a 30 hour training, which is not, it's not very long. Mm-hmm. And I actually have been working with Yoga Alliance in the US and trying to integrate some of those concepts into all trainings. I mean, because my, my goal would be that all 200 hour trainings include that material already, because actually, And in in the U.S., there's laws that public accommodation should be accessible. And I feel like yoga classes are public and anyone with a disability should be allowed to to go into the class and not be excluded. So I feel like it's actually the right thing to do and it's the legal thing to do in the U.S., but it doesn't mean it happens. Yeah, Um, yeah. Yeah. But yoga therapy, which is amazing, you need a lot of training, a lot of training. And that's more of a specialization in trying to help someone with their own self-healing. And that's not what I'm talking about. Accessible yoga is more just making regular yoga accessible to anyone who wants it. Because my, my dream is that anyone could go to any class and the teacher could handle it, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, the and teachers so, are well-trained. I guess just part of that process of this is how you teach this pose, it's just expanding it to this is how you teach this pose to a larger number of people who have some different needs. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's like just logical. I mean, <laughs> I, because it just, you know, like I said, we, we've misconstrued yoga a bit to be this extreme physical practice. But if you look beyond that part, you know, you realize that being an advanced yogi or being good at yoga, it doesn't mean you can touch your toes or stand on your head or any of that. To me, it means you are comfortable with yourself, you have some peace of mind, you have some tools that help you in difficult situations. I mean, that's, to me, that's advanced yoga. And I think everyone needs that. And and even for all the people who do the very extreme physical practice, what's going to happen when they get old or when they get Mm. sick? Mm. What are they going to do? They're going to, are they going to have failed at yoga because they're old? I mean, Mm. it's just, there's some, we're, we're like, so we're so limited in our thinking, I think, and not looking at a big picture of what's going to actually serve us you know, even in the end. And like aging, that is something that yeah. is going to affect all of us. <laughs> if we're lucky. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, maybe not all of us, yeah. 
yeah, either we're gonna you're gonna get sick or you're just gonna get old and probably both. I mean, it's just it's how life is. You know, mm-hmm. you can't avoid it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, do you have any uh, teaching strategies for teaching a diverse group of different ages, abilities, and sizes so that everyone has a great experience in your classes? Yes. <laughs> That's what that whole thing I thought you about. might. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I can tell you quickly a few, but I, I would say that's what, yeah, that's what that training is, actually. Mm-hmm. That training is not, not about, it's not yoga therapy. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, I'm not trying to find ways of healing different illnesses. What I'm trying to do is just make the practices accessible to anyone who wants them. And so there's two main areas I focus on in the training. One is on how to adapt mostly the physical practices. And that means trying to come up with skills, giving teachers skills to learn how to adapt in the moment, rather than having to memorize, you know, a bunch of variations of poses Mm -hmm. to actually look at what skills do you need to be able to think on the spot and be creative and collaborate with your student. So those are the two words I focus on is to approach yoga in a more creative way and also work on collaboration to learn how to empower the student to help make those decisions and to, in fact, empower them in general, because I think that's what we're trying to do in yoga, empower people. So that's the one side is to work on kind of the asana. We do some, I start by looking at why, why do we practice this pose? Like why, what is the purpose? And then if you kind of get what some of the main whys are, the benefits maybe, you can look at, oh, well, how can I give that same benefit to someone practicing in a chair or practicing in a bed or practicing standing at the wall? And then it becomes kind of a fun challenge to think of ways to do that. You know, to, and sometimes it doesn't look the same. I mean, it's not like I, I don't have to make a pose look the same in a chair on the mat, but maybe it has the same feeling. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Oh, Isn't definitely. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's that thing of like... It's not a external picture of what this pose is all about. It's like you're saying, like the benefits and the sensation, and it's kind of like, oh, how can I rearrange things so that this person can, can get that benefit out of that pose in a way that works for them? Exactly. There's a number of ways to do that. One is to what I call dissect the pose and take it in parts. So like if you have a complex pose, even like downward dog, it's very complex actually. But if you take out the parts, you think of, well, what is happening in the arms and shoulders, the upper back? And you look at that. Maybe I can create that experience for someone sitting in a chair. You know, if you bring the chair facing the wall, you can place your hands up on the wall and have kind of a similar upper body experience with down dog. Do you know what I'm saying? So you can yeah. take it apart. Another way would just, of course, just be creative, use props, change the orientation in space of so sometimes turning something around, putting it on the ground instead of standing, you know, like standing poses can generally be done on the ground and lying down. It's a great way to experience them, things like that. So yeah, just to kind of come at them from another angle. And I like to, I love the idea of creativity because I actually would say that to me, spirituality is creativity, that those are the same things. And that we're, where we find spirituality in our lives is where we have that creative energy flowing. Yeah. And that's also being present in the moment and just letting those ideas flow through you and having that connection to that other person and kind of evolving this process together. Like that is a movement meditation. Yeah. Yeah, And I, I think a lot of teachers, experienced teachers do that anyway. Like I, I think this is something that comes through experience. And so what I, the training I basically designed based on things I thought I had learned over my teaching career that many new teachers weren't being taught. Why do you have to wait and have to teach for 25 years before you learn this? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I can just tell you now. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Ron here, just popping back in to talk about our Patreon page. Now, what is Patreon, you might be asking? Well, Patreon is just a way where you can support our podcast from as little as $1 a month. Higher tiers get benefits such as shoutouts on the podcast or access to extra content. And speaking of which, we've filmed a short bonus video with Claire Kaneen demonstrating a chair yoga sequence. And that will go up on our Patreon page in about a week. Claire was a guest on the podcast a few episodes back and she's hosting a chair yoga teacher training at Garden of Yoga, our studio, in June. There's just a couple of spots left, so get in quick. I'll leave a link in our show notes for that one. We also have enough funds to transcribe another episode and we've put that up for a vote on our Patreon page. So if you'd like to learn more, just go to patreon.com slash flow artist podcast. I'll leave a link in our show notes. All right, let's get back to the conversation with Jivana. And 
And so this next question is from the point of view of a new teacher. Say someone comes into your class with a health issue that you've never heard of, you're completely unfamiliar with it. What are some of the ways that you can assess whether that person will be safe to be in your class? And if you just do not feel equipped to be able to teach them safely, how do you express this yeah. skillfully? Well, that's a great question. I, but I just want to go back for one second, and this yeah. might help with that with that question. Just to say, the other skill that I want to, that I focus on in the training that I think is essential in terms of teaching multiple levels is just that: is trying to train teachers to teach multiple levels at the same time and to look at the techniques for doing that, so that you could have a student practicing and chair next to someone on the mat. And I think that there are ways to do it, and there is there are skills. I guess is what I'm saying that make that much easier and so that's the other thing we work on in the training um, just that idea of multi-level classes because i think that's how you bring people together so then i can try and answer your question i mean i think it's a it's a challenging situation that, that question of a student that maybe you don't feel prepared to teach and i would say that if you don't feel prepared to teach them then you probably shouldn't and you should be honest with them and try to refer them to a teacher you think that would be more suitable for them. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I'm, I don't have the skills needed to serve you. But I would also encourage that you as a teacher then to really look at what skills do I need to feel more comfortable teaching that person? I, I think part of the answer has to do with understanding how yoga teaching is different than yoga therapy. And I think there's some confusion there. I've got some perspectives from my own teaching as well, like some things yeah. that have really helped me. It's not always okay. possible, but ahead of time, um, we have an online new client form. And so then you at least get a little heads up if someone has a different health condition and you have a chance to look into it and do a bit of research. And also you have the chance to get in touch with that person before class and mm -hmm. so that you don't have to say someone just arrives at class. You don't necessarily want to have a long conversation with a lot of other people yeah. around you, but yeah. if you have the chance to talk to them beforehand, you can kind of check in and find out if they've done yoga before and just what the actual physical sensations of that condition might be, what, what limitations they might have of their movement, what other issues might come up and I found that I don't know sometimes when people first start teaching they feel like they should know everything but the more that you actually mm -hmm. talk to someone about what is going on for them because different health conditions can manifest in really different ways for different people and make learning about that person in particular as part of the process like the more that will just help you in the future yeah. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, again, I, I think part of it has to do with understanding the what we call the scope of practice of a yeah. yoga teacher, and that you know, we, so in the U.S., you know, the Yoga, yoga Alliance hasn't had a scope of practice before, but they're currently creating one, and um, I'm so relieved because I think it's going to help this a lot. And it's basically, I actually have seen a draft. They're going to release it any week, any day now. Actually, it's coming out. They're releasing a whole bunch of new standards and they're going through a whole standards review process there's a new code of conduct which i actually helped work on for them and a scope of practice which i wasn't involved with but i saw it and basically it's just basically saying that yoga teachers are not yoga therapists you know yeah and yeah. Uh, yeah so within our scope is learning how to adapt practices for people but that's really all we can do yeah and, and i think and there's a crazy thing in the u.s you know with liability it's quite extreme here you know with lawsuits and stuff so there's actually i mean these days i recommend that pe that yoga teachers are very careful about asking about medical information if they're not if they don't have a special training or if they're not a yoga therapist it's actually better to not ask okay if people tell you that's fine but legally speaking at least in the u.s you're more liable the more you know so Right. If you know about someone's condition and then you do something to harm them, you're more responsible. But what if someone comes into your class with vertigo or something and you're just putting yeah. them in all of these positions that's making them yeah. feel terrible well, because you haven't asked? No, so in that case, ideally the student will tell you if they have some kind of symptom that is going to interfere with their practice. And I hope, you know, I would hope that someone with vertigo would speak up. Mm. and say by the way, fall over. Yeah. <laughs> no i mean yeah unfortunately you might have to just wait to the because the fact is students don't tell you anyway even if you do ask mm. i mean i know it sounds harsh to say don't ask but even if you ask they may not tell you or they may not tell you the truth i've had many cases where people did not tell me something i found out later found out later 
they have some really severe situation going on that they didn't want to tell me. And that's fine. You know, it's, it's private information too. Like if I'm coming in as a yoga teacher, I'm not a medical professional. I really should not be involved in their medical care. If I'm a yoga therapist, that's the difference. You know, a yoga therapists could find out about that and work with their medical team and get involved in that and do an intake, formal intake and understand, you know, in yoga therapy, you should understand what those terms mean. The yoga teacher probably wouldn't even know. But I think it's more symptom based in yoga teaching. So I could, yeah, I definitely want to know. I would ask my students to tell me, you know, if something's bothering you, come and talk to me and tell me and I'll find another way for you to do it. So I would hope students would come to me in that way, you know, like, oh, yeah, I'm having vertigo. Well, then definitely don't do any inversions. Keep your head level, something like that. I don't know. Is, is sound, does that make sense? Because yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a complicated it's just, topic. It is. It's a really complicated topic. And I think what you're saying as well, part of that is just creating an environment in your class where people feel comfortable to speak up about things and to tell you about what's going on for them and so that you can work together to create a practice that's going to work for them. Exactly. And there's nothing wrong with a student telling you about their medical issues, but I wouldn't necessarily ask beyond a question such as, how are you doing? You know, yeah. I would just say that. How are you doing today? You know, and if I meet someone new, yeah, what's going on? Have you done yoga before? And what's your experience? And then if they're, if they say, well, I have problems here with this shoulder or something, then you'll know that, or you can see while they're practicing. And that's usually what happens anyway, honestly, is that while students are practicing, you see someone's not comfortable or they're not doing something and you can maybe then ex- have an exchange with them, try this other way, you know, or, you know, would you like another way to do it? I think that's the only way to go. Um, and so do you not have like a new client form when people come to your classes? Well, you know, I stopped teaching public classes these days. I've been oh, so yeah. busy, but I actually stopped anyway, even though I ha- I'm a yoga therapist, but I felt that as a yoga therapist, I would prefer to teach small groups and one-on-one. And when I was teaching larger groups, I would just try to have this conversation. And, and the way I would say this is I would say kind of to everyone in the beginning, like, I want to help you learn how to take care of yourself. That's what we're doing here. So please come talk to me or get my attention if you need any help with anything. And I'll try to give some, I try to mention some contraindications that are commonly known for some practices. You know, and if you're concerned about something, you can definitely talk to me. But I kind of put it on them. And I Mm -hmm. just think that's the only way to go. It's just, and then during the class, continually tell people that this is about learning to take care of yourself. And that pushing too hard, for example, is not doing yoga (laughs) you know achieving something external is not what yoga is about and i think this is where we get stuck people have a little bit of a confusion about that right what is the goal of the class what is the purpose i mean maybe it's exercise for some in some ways and that's great but that's really not what yoga is yeah definitely would you like to tell us about your book yeah i just finished the book which i'm very excited about and to me it's pretty simple i just try i tried to offer practices that you know most people could do i offered many variations of practices so the audience is really new yoga students who may not think they can practice because like i said earlier i feel like that's the main obstacle is that people just don't think they can do yoga or they can't be a teacher so i just tried to offer practices that i feel like are very accessible a lot of chair a lot of chair work and bed yoga and then i also have a bunch of about 20 guest contributors who are people i know mostly yoga teachers who have disabilities themselves. I ask them to pick a pose and then to say, give me a quote about why they like to practice. And, and then we got a picture of them doing their, their version of that pose. So it might be like, you know, someone doing their version of some pose and saying why it works for them, like in a chair or doing something against the wall or something. And then, and then I'll show like a bunch of other variations of that pose. I'm just trying to show diverse bodies as well. Yeah. And we'll see. It comes out in the fall. (laughs) (laughs) It was fun, though. I love writing. Fantastic. And so have you noticed that you've driven this as well, that awareness of accessible yoga has evolved over time? And I'm wondering what you think the important next steps are. Yeah, I think I think that's a good question. Like I said, in the U.S., because of changes happening at Yoga Alliance, I'm hoping, I could be wrong, because, I mean, they're far from perfect, but I'm hoping that changes in 200-hour trainings will help to make some of this more mainstream. Um, I think that's, the, that's what will happen in the future, is that accessible yoga will become more just yoga, 
you know, and there won't be so much of a differentiation anymore. I mean, part of that is probably kind of like a corporate takeover kind of thing. <laughs> what is that called? You know, not takeover, but whatever that called when they, there's a word for that. But, you know, like corporations seeing the new thing and they kind of want to embrace that. And that's a little scary to me. I don't know how to deal with that. But, you know, as long as they allow, this is the challenge, right? The challenge is to keep the voices of community members, people who are doing the work at the forefront, rather than allow accessible yoga to just be co-opted, I guess that's the word, by corporate interests. Um, and really trying to find the balance of working with those corporate interests to change, change the yoga culture, and yet not let them completely co-opt the message and that that's the balance that i see trying to find does that make sense yeah definitely it's actually something that yoga journal has been <laughs> criticized for a couple of times where they'll have something right. like a an issue that's all about body image and then they'll put someone Oh, was there a cover yeah. not long ago where it was like yeah. Jessamine was like on a back cover and then they just had the normal skinny white lady on the front cover and it's like, no, well, that's no, they, not they representation. They did, yeah, they did half and half. They put Jessamine Stanley in half the covers and then Maria Rahu, who's an ama amazing, very experienced teacher, but they put her on the other half. And it, yeah, it felt like, yeah, it felt like exactly that it's kind of like they want to use the message. They want it to be more inclusive, and they, but they don't, they won't. They're not committed to that as a as an entire way of seeing the world. And I think that's the real challenge is I don't know if it's even possible to shift corporate culture to be more inclusive and equitable and less basically white supremacist. I mean, that's yeah. what we're looking at is is a whole you know system that's based on that using anything they can, anything that the larger culture can um, kind of takes it in and makes it part of their <laughs> message, part of their uh marketing scheme kind of, I mean, it sounds so paranoid, but it's kind of true. <laughs> and I think Yoga Journal did that. Yeah. But I also know that I've talked to the editor at Yoga Journal after that, and there's conflicts there, I think, within their, within their company, you know, like different, like I think the editor really wants to bring in that voice, but there's competing interests because she's beholden to a very large company. And I, and I just think that's, that's the challenge, right? How do you handle those conflicting interests that, work in the world um, and i guess yeah how do you yeah. handle a commercial goal which is completely mm -hmm. separate of a yoga goal yeah. and i guess sometimes they can align if it's all about reaching people and empowering people to use this practice to help themselves you know it doesn't yeah. mean that someone can't have a sustainable living from delivering that but often it just doesn't work out that way. Right. And I mean, it's quite amazing if you look at yoga, actually, that the amount of money there is in yoga. I mean, I think it's like th over $30 billion a year. I think now it's probably more, way more than that was as of like three years ago. So it's like multi, multi-billion dollar industry. And yet most yoga teachers I know are struggling and can barely, could barely make a living even as a full-time teacher. You know, and I actually know very few full-time teachers when I really look at it. I and mean, most people generally have to do a balance of things. They'll do yoga and then do something else. It's very hard to make a living. And that, that is just heartbreaking to me that there's all this money there, but it's not going to yoga teachers. I think it's going to the clothing companies. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no. So you're really active on Instagram, which is already a platform that's pretty notorious for celebrating some of the more superficial aspects yeah. of yoga, I guess. So how important is it to represent a diverse range of bodies and the ways that yoga can be adapted to be accessible to everyone online? Yeah, I mean, it's essential. That, that's why I really want to be on Instagram a lot, because I just feel like Instagram is, well, it's a visual medium, and so you get these really extreme poses a lot of mm. yeah thin people doing yoga on the beach i mean i actually it's funny i had stopped following most of those people and the other day i kind of went back and i looked at more like popular yoga sites and i was kind of blown away that it's still happening i, I, I just kind of <laughs> thought it had gone away just because it's gone out of my mind <laughs> but, wow it's still there and they have like millions of followers you know and some of them are great teachers actually i mean i know a few of them and i think they really are some of those big name yogi people are really trying to, to make a change but i think that's what we need to do is just put like bombard social media with 
other kinds of imagery. You know, that's, that's what I'm trying to do with the book. Actually, the book is just an effort to try and get that out there. Kind of like I need a book to help me. I don't know why, but these days it's like you have to have a book. Mm-hmm. Of course, I like writing, so that's been fun. And I feel like that'll help me just hopefully get images out there that are more diverse. Because it, it really pains me to think that people aren't practicing because of a misunderstanding of who can who can do yoga. It's so sad, isn't it? It's so painful to me. I mean, I've gained so much and there's so much benefit there. It's really heartbreaking to think that people don't do it because they think, oh, I can't, I can't touch my toes, I can't do yoga, or, you know, I can't stand, so I can't do yoga. I mean, you can do it. There's, anyone can do yoga. You just have to have a teacher who's skilled enough to work with you. And I think as well, just yeah. that initial desire and feeling that you will be accepted, just walking into that first class. And I think that's why yeah. representation is so important online, just knowing yeah. that yoga is for everybody. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I get why people don't go to class. I think that it's intimidating. You know, even for me, you know, you go to class, you think people are going to be watching you or judging you. And, and yet, you know, it's often not the case, actually. I mean, it, if you choose wisely, you can do your research and you can find the yoga studios that are really open-minded and inclusive. And they're amazing places. I mean, all over the world, I've seen the most incredible yoga communities everywhere. So they're there. You just have to find them. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do, too, is help people find each other (laughs) through accessible yoga i'm sure your place must be great oh we really um it's our goal like we want to be really welcoming and really inclusive Mm -hmm. for everyone and just to be a place where everyone feels comfortable like they know they'll be supported and unfortunately like we're not wheelchair accessible we have some steps Mm -hmm. so that is a barrier Mm -hmm. to people but um Mm -hmm. beyond that we really want to do everything that we can to like share this practice because we love it and it's helped us both in a lot of different ways and it's the joy of being a teacher being able to share these practices and see people like kind of blossom Mm -hmm. in their own yoga practice Mm -hmm. and hear about how it's helped them in their lives like it's I don't know. I feel like it's the heart of this practice. Mm. And, and I guess we also try to make sure that, you know, even the pictures on our website are, are mm-hmm. you know, images of re- really diverse people, different yeah. bodies and different, you know, ethnic backgrounds and, and genders. So, yeah. It's... And luckily, like, that's the people who practice here. We just kind of do oh, free okay. photo days. <laughs> and so anyone who wants to kind of be, you know, okay. we do a free class and we're like, we're going to take some pictures for our website. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of been like a nice, fun community thing for us as well. And when we've been posting about that on Facebook and stuff, like we've mentioned, like we want to show different bodies, we want to show different ages, like we want to show that this is a practice mm-hmm. for everyone. Yeah. Well, that's right. I think you hit the the main points there which is the marketing materials financial accessibility physical accessibility is good too but you know if if you don't have a wheelchair accessible space it might be nice to offer classes outside the studio as well in other community centers or places near you i mean sometimes it's amazing what i see a lot of studios do where they take they take money that they make from classes and then use that to pay teachers serving in the community. It's quite amazing what one yoga studio can do actually in a community. Um, Yeah, that's something that I have been thinking about coming back to that question I asked earlier about how to make it sustainable for a teacher and for a studio, maybe just, you know, having your classes that you do charge a little bit more for so that you Mm -hmm. can offer a free class or a subsidized class or I was even thinking as well of applying, like researching and seeing what grants are out there and what other Mm -hmm other funding is available. Yeah, so a lot, I wouldn't say a lot, but a number of studios that I teach at, and I kind of pick them actually for this reason, they're they're a non-profit, at least in the US, or even around the world, there's similar, you know, organizational types of businesses where you're just not for profit, and then you can get grants, and people can make donations to you that can be tax deductible. And so some studios I know, they use the money then to pay teachers in the community. Often a studio will have two businesses there, you could have the regular studio, and then a kind of non-profit arm where people can make donations, you can get grants, and that money can be used for scholarships or to pay teachers to go out into the community. So you can have both going, actually, at least in the U.S. I don't know about Australia. I think that's a great way to go. And I think we'll see more of that. I think we'll see more funding for those kinds of yoga programs. I actually know some that are starting. I think it's pretty exciting. Correct me if I'm wrong, but are are you planning to have a conference over in Australia at some point in the future? (laughs) Well, um... (laughs) 
We haven't planned a conference yet, although that's probably a good idea, but I'm starting with some training. So I'm currently working on trying to schedule some accessible yoga trainings in Australia in 2020. Probably maybe November 2020, I'm thinking. That's what I'm shooting for right now, trying to figure out where to go. Maybe out of that, I could meet people and we could create a conference because the conferences are actually run by volunteers. There's, we, have, we have a small staff but a lot of the on the ground logistics is organized by local volunteers. And so we moved the conference to places where there's a team. And last year we were in um, Toronto and then outside of Berlin. And then this spring at the end of May, we'll be in St. Louis, Missouri. And then in October, we'll be in New York city, but maybe Australia someday. Oh, There's we, a lot of yoga there. Yeah, <laughs> we'd love it. <laughs> yeah, I've had amazing reaction. I mean, so many people from Australia reach out to me. We have an Australian group, right? You're on there, the Facebook group. Oh, I don't think I am, actually. I think oh, okay. I just know you from Instagram, but um, I'm going to oh, okay. be seeking it out. <laughs> so yeah, is, that, have... is that group open for everyone? Is it a public group? Yeah. Or... yeah. Yeah, they're public groups. We have actually 23 public groups through Accessible Yoga. And uh, the main one is Accessible Yoga Community which people can join. That's, I mean, I think there's 2,500 people on there. And that's a great place to ask questions about bringing yoga to special populations, actually. And then we have local groups, like more like an like Australia group, for example, or actually many of them are by language. So we have 10 language groups, like Spanish, French, German, Greek, Dutch, Swedish, like that. And then some different regions in the U.S. We have a bunch of teams on different regions, and they have their own groups. But yeah, I think Facebook has been a really great format for organizing actually because it's free and accessible but yeah please join us on oh yeah we'll join and we'll pop your links up with the episode Mm -hmm. as well okay and for your trainings when you have the information for that yeah yeah that'd be great where are you actually i don't even know where you're located oh we're in melbourne in Melbourne. Okay, yeah. So I think I'll be coming to Melbourne. I'm, I'm looking at, we're looking at a place there. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out where Australia is so big and <laughs> to try to come, <laughs> you know, in one trip to reach a few different places is kind of challenging, but I will. It'll happen. We're probably reaching near the end of our conversation, but I did want to ask you, do, do you think if you could distill everything that you've learned and everything you teach down to one core essence, what do you think that one thing would be? (laughs) Wow, that's a hard question. Do you ask everyone that question? We We do. do. (laughs) Oh, you do? Can I ask you what you would say? Yeah, I have been thinking about this a little bit because I I don't know if you you might have seen about the uh, attack that happened in New Zealand. Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, yeah and I'm I'm from New Zealand, so mm-hmm. you know this sort of hit home for me mm-hmm. quite a bit. But I, I think what I'm really leaning towards at the moment is that uh, you know love and compassion is so important, and that we seem to be going deeper into hate and division at the moment, and it's really quite concerning. So. Yeah, I think we really need to work on that. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. For me, yoga is a practice of learning to know ourselves and learning to understand ourselves and learning to have love and compassion for ourselves as well. And I think as a teacher, I want to be able to share this practice in a way that people can connect with and can benefit from and can get what they need from that practice and also to be able to hone that ability to tune in to what is it that I need today from my practice and then have that time where they can just be present with that and then when you move back out into the world it's like you've refilled a little well inside you and then you have more energy to draw from to do all of the things that you want to do in the world Mm -hmm. that's nice yeah well well i i would say you know for me i go back to my main sources for yoga which is the yoga sutras of patanjali and the bhagavad gita and i think about what you know i try i spend a lot of my time thinking about how those two scriptures work together when i mean there's a lot of other scriptures in yoga but these are still the main two that we're using in modern yoga and i always come to this feeling of the way i said it i think in my book was you know calm the mind free the heart that's what i said calm the mind and free the heart and what i actually mean by that is that 
you know, according to the sutras, yoga is about quieting the mind. And then the outcome is then that the spirit will be revealed. But I think in the Gita, it's offered in this different way, which is almost like God is there in your heart calling to you. And that the idea of the Gita is actually the song of God. It's actually the song. It's like God is singing to you like calling to you to come back to yourself. And I, I think that's what I feel yoga is. It's like the calling to come back to yourself. We get so lost. To me, it's like we were completely externally focused most of our lives and yoga is just coming back home, you know, to be at peace with yourself, to be able to be with yourself and friends with yourself. Sometimes I say yoga is making friends with your own mind. Yeah. You know. Oh, that's really beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Thanks for asking. I can talk about that forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's my well, favorite topic. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today. We've learned so yeah. much about accessible yoga, and I think we're really looking forward to it. I hope we get the chance to meet you at some point soon. So, yeah, yeah thanks so much for speaking with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, you're always welcome to come here or come to a conference or else you have to wait till I come. <laughs> well, maybe maybe but, Asia or somewhere in the middle, somewhere yeah, between the States and America. <laughs> yeah, Asia, right. But I just want to thank you, you know, for inviting me and also for the work you're doing. I mean, I know this is a lot of work and, you know, it's such an important conversation and I know you have some really amazing guests really looking at this area. And like I said, this, this, is, this is the way we change yoga is actually by talking about it in this way. And so you're, you know, you're creating that change by having this podcast so i really appreciate that thank you oh thank, thank you, you so much and like it is fascinating for us like hearing different people's stories and different people's approaches it's like mm -hmm. that's why we do this like that's what lights us yeah. up mm -hmm. yeah i know me too i should probably do a podcast i just don't have time but <laughs> it's kind of like the conference you know i get people to come in person and then we meet there and i hear their stories it's quite amazing it's amazing what yoga can do it really is yeah <laughs> So many thanks to Jivana. What an inspiring guy. I think he's doing amazing work and we were very lucky to get the opportunity to speak with him. Now we have another amazing guest coming up on the next episode, Timothy McCall. Now Timothy literally wrote the book on yoga as medicine. Like literally I have it on my bookshelf and he put that knowledge to great use, essential use as he went through his journey with throat cancer. It's all covered in his book, Saving My Neck, which is out now, and we speak about this in our interview, and that comes out in about two weeks' time. All right, as always, our theme song is Baby Robots by Ghost Soul and used with permission. Get his music from ghostsoul.bandcamp.com. Thank you so, so much for listening. That's 50 episodes down, and here is to another 50. Aroha nui, big, big love. <laughs>